the world is really fickle with their timing of things. Mm -hmm. It's upsetting to me. Good. There's like three major things that we need to talk about on this podcast. And each of them would warrant like a massive discussion on their own. And we're not going to be able to really do any of them no. <laughs> in a no. single podcast. But that's fine because we have we have friends and we might do additional podcasts to talk about things. Because we've got a lot on the docket on this, the Lord's 70th episode of the Duels and Manadors podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. In this, we like to talk about magic and D&D and apparently controversies in the tabletop RPG space, which we'll get into that too with the Crit Awards. You it's know, a whole it's, thing. It's been a hot second. I feel like the community was was in a lull for a while, for a while and um, you know, it was only expected, I think. They, they needed some... Come up. They, it was only a matter of time before something else riled them up. Yes. To be quite frank. To be frank. Uh, I'm Connor. And I'm Frank. Okay. Okay. Well, then you can be Frank <laughs> in be this instance. Frank, yes. um, but yeah, we're going to talk about all the stuff that's going on with the Crit Awards and Gen Con. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about Gen Con just because, you know, we're excited about it. We're going there. We are going there. That's the thing we're doing. Yeah. And uh, tons of previews for Magic. Tons of previews for D&D. We're not going to be able to dive deep into any of them. Hey, we're not going to be able. This is an episode sixty-nine. I'm nope, sorry. Nope, I, not anymore. I apologize. We're, we're done we're, with that. We've we've we've, craw- we've pierced the veil. We've crested the, the wave. Hill. Sure, that too. The wave. The hill. I mean, I mean it, it, can you crest a hill? Yeah. I you can crest a toothbrush. That's just putting toothpaste on toothbrush. Yes. Uh, okay. That, yeah. Yep. That is. Yeah. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> It's fucking stupid is what it is. But um, let's go. We got we got a spiel. We got the normal spiel. We're going to Gen Con, Indianapolis at the beginning of August. So that'll be very fun. Um, a month away. It is a month away. You did Okay. I have a question. Yes. Did you get a ticket for the Bloomboro pre-con thing? I did not. Okay. I didn't either. They're all sold out. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The Chaos pre-con battles are not sold out. I kind of want to like see what kinds of pre-cons people are being handed before I just roll up to the event with generic tickets. But like, if it's just, like reasonable pre-cons, then I'd be willing to do that. Yeah. But the pre-con battle events at Gen Con are like super fun. That's what got us into yeah. magic originally. It was a great time. Um, I also just want to do more just general pods for Commander or Oathbreaker or whatever one thing I've, Con. One thing I've heard about people doing at other cons, not more magic-specific cons, is you know those... Um, those stands that uh, restaurants give you to put on your table that have like the little number that says, "Hey, person who's serving me food, bring it here." Yeah, like, kind of like kind of like at the McAllisters. Yeah, and exactly. Stuff. Uh, people bringing one of those and then putting a little card, like a note card, in it that says, "Looking for Commander Pod or something, or, or willing once uh, want to play, and then like or Power Level like a, Seven or something." <laughs> like a classifieds ad. Yeah, exactly. For, like a Craigslist or something stupid. You just plop yourself down at a random table, put that down, and, and wait. <laughs> <laughs> that's ridiculous I love that I love that because of how ridiculous it is uh, but yeah I want to do that and I I personally got a press badge you did we were, we were not able to get two but looking at you Gen Con what, yeah, what's up Gen, Gen Con? Con yeah Indianapolis but I have a press badge so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to like a one like a, the one ring RPG they're doing like a little preview thing for an expansion or something and I'm getting a ton of press emails as well and I'm like I don't care about most of this <laughs> You know, there's a lot of cool things. There are a lot of cool there things. Are, that's that the just thing. Don't there are really appeal. So to me. many things that there's a pro, there's a wide gambit of content creators and and reporters and, and yeah. press people out there that they do that probably some of them probably some of them get nobody. Oh yeah, probably some of them get a lot of people. Absolutely, I bet the One Ring is the One Ring RPG is going to get a lot of people just because it's Lord of the Rings. It's but, pretty cool. Uh, my favorite change for Gen Con this year. Best thing that has happened so far. Best best Gen Con thing. You can get free refills if you buy the cup. Mm. You, if you buy the Gen Con cup, it used to be like a dollar or two to refill, it's and now it's just, and now you just buy the cup and you can just walk up to one of the fountains, you can fill it up. So nice. that's major life improvement in my estimation. Um, I drink water. I also I also bring a water bottle, but you know I like the cup. Stay hydrated, kids. Always stay hydrated. Always stay hydrated. Uh, but. Before we get into the Crit Awards, which will be the first thing, and we've got magic previews for Bloomboro and Duskmorn and a new set with MTG Foundations. We also got all of the PHB videos they've been talking about. Uh, we're going to get into the spiel because, you know, we're creators. This is a podcast. You can get it on podcast services around the globe. It goes live for everybody every other Monday at around 1230 asterisk. 
it's an estimate. We have we have full time jobs that are not this. <laughs> it would be awesome if it was. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. I don't, I don't think that's gonna happen. But you can get it on podcast services around the globe: Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, all that kind of stuff. We get a YouTube. If you want to see the video podcast, we post to our YouTube channel for the Dungeon Bros. Try to get those watch hours up. Watch them. Watch them there. Let them play in the background. Yeah, put them on silent. I'm on the, the playlist. Play. Listen to our dulcet tones, if you will. Uh, you can also get the podcast early and ad free on patreon.com slash the dungeon bros at the $5 tier. You can get early ad free access to all of the content that we release. Uh, we have polls there for, for video ideas or podcast guests. Every week we post a podcast thread where you can ask questions where you want answered on the show. Give us your comments. Give us your weird stories and shit. I don't really care. Just something goofy. And if you want to only do that. You can join the Patreon for free, and you'll get access to the feed. It'll be fun. Okay. You won't be able to watch the stuff early or ad-free. Just on time. Just on time, like like the rest of you. Like you've always been able to. Yes. It's a whole thing. It is a whole thing. But, oh, we also do bonus action, which is our supplemental podcast. We've had Ivy from the Crit Awards on twice to talk about the Crit Awards. Uh, big updates to that. Yeah. Big updates to that. And our friend Typical Gemini, we had him on recently to talk about Magic the Gathering. Uh, that just went up last week, if you're watching this now. Where if you're we? watching this, it went up already. It's already up. You can you can see it. We talk about Modern Horizons 3. We talk about Magic the Gathering just in general. It's a great time. And you're probably going to see more of him when we do... I, I think we're going to start doing bonus actions of like deeper dive set review stuff. Mm -hmm. Style stuff for like... Bloomborough and Duskmorn House of Horrors. Hooers. House of Hooers. Maybe we'll shit on Assassin's Creed more. I know you'll you you, you I think it, it's more geared to you. Yes, as all as, as, all, as yeah. all of these universes beyond are meant to be. Mm -hmm. Uh they they you know what? These universes beyond they're they're kind of meant to be participate as you desire. Um, and I think a lot of the time we kind of get into the mindset of, oh, there's a new set we have to participate as, as a community. Yeah. I will say maybe the Assassin's Creed, uh, is not what I would have hoped it to be, but that being said, oh, well, we can only do so much. That is true. That is true. All right. We got to talk. Mm -hmm. We got to talk. So the Crit Awards have found themselves uh, embroiled in a little bit of controversy. And I want to note before we start this conversation, we have had the CEO of the Crit Awards, Ivy, on our podcast twice for bonus action, talking about the nominations process and getting excited for the second year of the Crit Awards and then going into some of the cl some of the more stuff recently. Mm -hmm. um, we don't this this those podcasts were recorded before anything of what we are about to discuss happened. Uh, but we also want to disclose that we have sponsored the Crit Awards. Yes. We've, we've given them money because we like what they do. So whatever we have to say, whatever opinions, like you can take that with whatever grains of salt that you want. But about a week, week and a half ago, uh, the Crit Awards changed one of the policies for nominees. Uh, that policy change was to explicitly... Uh, disqualify any creators that displayed what they referred to as Zionist behavior, beliefs, or actions. Uh, and then we believed at the time that it was clearly geared toward a specific nominee that we don't know specifically who it is, but I bet you could look through and figure that out. We're not going to call people out like that. Uh, and then they found themselves embroiled in a lot of backlash because of that policy change. So... First first things first, what is Zionism? Zionism is a a Jewish Israeli ideology that is not inherently Jewish or or Judeo whatever. It's not inherently Israeli either. It is a specific subset of the belief in that area in that belief system of expansion of the Israeli state through conquest, through capturing of more land, and it has existed for a very, very long time. There is a massive conflation between the Jewish ideology and the Zionist ideology. It's like it's like a square and, and rectangle thing. All, all squares are rectangles. All Zionists are Jewish, are Jewish. Not all Jews are Zionists. Okay, it's the same kind of idea of uh, Christian crusades. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the Christian Crusades back in the day when they were trying to expand Christianity, conquering more lands and imposing their beliefs. And Zionists, in in their own way, want to expand Judaism and force their beliefs on specific regions. In this case, specifically, the Gaza Strip and Palestine regions, and they want to reclaim or officially completely claim all of the land around uh, Jerusalem and all of that. That is not what we're here to talk about. No. The backlash that they received was largely from people then calling the Crit Awards anti-Semitic uh, and giving threats of violence to the staff at the Crit Awards, Ivy, and threatening violence at the event itself. Okay? That is where we are as of about a week and a half ago. And then the Crit Awards gave this statement. Quote, Due to recent events and the attention that we have received, it is, an extreme, it is with an extremely heavy heart and much disappointment that the Crit Awards will be unable to return to Gen Con for its 2024 event due to safety concerns. With that said, we will be continuing forward with a virtual event as we evaluate how we will be moving forward with the celebration of the amazing creators and phenomenal community members in the tabletop RPG space. Tickets purchased for Gen Con event will be refunded. We encourage any of our nominees who wish to remove their participation in any capacity to please reach out. Uh, voting will still remain open until July 7th. If you are watching this, you can still vote if, we, as you're seeing it, record us recording it live or um, or if you are watching it on Patreon. By the time this goes live on Monday, it, the voting period will have already passed. Uh, and then, quote, we want to take this moment to reaffirm our stance that hate in any capacity will not be tolerated by any individual or groups within our event. We ask patience as we come to terms with the situation and want to thank the community for the outpouring of support and positivity. I can never fully express what it means to both myself and the entire Crit Awards team. And that is a quote from Ivy on the Crit Awards social media accounts. Um, and this statement caused another wave of, of issues for them of people calling out Gen Con, beginning to boycott Gen Con as, the, as some people were seeing that as implying that Gen Con canceled the event due to their pro-Palestinian stance, which they're very, they, the, if you look at any of the members of the board or Ivy, they've been rather outspoken on their social media about mm -hmm. their support of Palestine. Dungeon Bros don't take a stance because we're, we talk about magic and D and D. And while Sam and I have our opinions on things, it doesn't really matter. You guys shouldn't care what our opinions are on geopolitics. <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. So if you want to know what our opinions are, you can feel free to ask them. But this is not really the format for that. Um, a couple of days ago, the Crit Awards released another longer statement that went through the specifics. I'm not going to read it all verbatim, uh, but we're going to give some bullet points here. They, she basically, Ivy then goes on to give us a... Um, a breakdown of more specifically of what had happened. Uh, on Monday, June 24th, Ivy was alerted by her staff that there was a situation breaking out that required emergency attention. Their various social media presences were being targeted by a group of people who deemed their stances as against their own, and they felt the need to use hostility to make their point known. As a result, this resulted in an onslaught of harassment against her staff, herself, and those that they strive to recognize with the Crit Awards. Uh, by a little bit after noon Pacific time that day, they received an email from a member of Gen Con staff requesting a phone call, which happened shortly after and lasted for about 15 minutes, 12, 15 minutes. Uh, we want to emphasize that the particular staff member was very kind and apologetic in both the situation and the need to facilitate the phone call. They were presented with a series of options, and as the team evaluated their situation and the options that were presented to them, they chose... Uh, they became clear that they did not think it would be possible for the Crit Awards to return to Gen Con in 2024, and they made that decision several hours later and then released it to th that decision to the public. Uh, they wanted to prioritize the safety of the nominees and attendees of the event, uh, and they still stand by their publicly expressed opinions. Uh, they do not condone harassment, violence, or terrorism. Zion and they say, quote, Zionism is a movement that has historically been weaponized to support the establishment and maintenance of an Israeli apartheid. We take issue with the pro-imperialist anti-Semitic rhetoric that has led to the incorrect conflation of Judaism with Zionism. We support a free Palestine and denotes, 
denounce the genocide that has been occurring, end quote. So the next level of this, Gen Con did not kick them out because they were secretly like a pro-Israeli, pro-Jewish organization that tried to kick them out because they were pro-Palestine. No, they kicked them out or they presented them with options of what they could do going forward. And the Crit Awards decided that the option that they wanted to go with was not going to Gen Con for safety concerns. Um, while we do not take a stance, because that is not our place, and our opinion on that shouldn't matter to you, we are creators that talk about D&D and Magic the Gathering. Our opinions on international politics, on international crises and humanitarian crisis, we have our opinions. Mm -hmm. I think we are somewhat educated in our opinions, and they are what they are, and it shouldn't matter to you, quite frankly. That being said, we still will choose to support the Crit Awards because as an organization, the Crit Awards is highlighting people in our community that we think deserve to be highlighted. Mm -hmm. Recognizing the, f the creators that set a lot of time aside, spend a lot of money, and try to make people's lives better, we're all for that. I'm sad that we're not going to be able to go to the event at Gen Con. Uh, and I am sad that they had to deal with the amount of harassment and threats of violence that they did. One thing I think we both can agree on, threats of violence and uh, and harassment, not really warranted, regardless of the ideology. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I don't think it, I don't think that pro-Palestinian people should be harassing Jewish people. I don't think the Jewish people should be harassing pro-Palestinian people. I don't think any of that is okay. Yeah, the violence begets violence. Yeah. And uh, while we, we, yeah, we speak on Magic Gathering D&D and what we see the community doing. Yeah. And um, the, I feel like the likelihood that the main chunk of the community that we are part of that this crit reward is trying to uh trying to feature is not the community that is uh is not the portion of the community that we are seeing this reaction from not at all uh yeah so in the future we hope that they do get the chance to come back mm -hmm. we hope that we do get the chance to uh participate with them again but this year it seems that um that will not be happening. That will not be happening. Uh, we still, we still like Ivy. Yeah, we she's, still. She's a wonderful person. Wonderful person. We love the organization. Um, I also, I also, and this is just this is Connor speaking, not Sam. Companies don't need to take political stances. Organizations don't need to take political stances. If they feel the need to, then they are more than welcome to. But there's a reason we don't, and it's. In, in much the same way that I don't think our opinion as the Dungeon Bros really matters on a lot of these issues. I mean, the Crit Awards can take whatever stance they want and mm -hmm. just, I don't know. That's just me. That's just me. Anyway, before we get back to the rest of this episode of the Duels and Manadorks podcast, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, ProxyForge. ProxyForge creates high quality Magic the Gathering proxies for you to use in your commander decks and really anywhere you want. You can get custom Magic the Gathering packs that include CEDH staples as well as monocolor commander staples, cycles of expensive cards like tutors and the swords. You can also get upgrade packs for commander precons that include 10 cards to soup up your favorite precon. If all you want is a very simple mana base, you can get any of the cycles of lands as well as lands organized by color pairing. And that's not to say anything about the custom art soul rings you can acquire as well as the plethora of singles available to you. Use the link in the description below to help us out and check out Proxy Forge to help bling out your board state. We will move on. We're going to go with the upcoming releases in Dungeons & Dragons and Magic the Gathering. We're going to stop after the Magic the Gathering stuff. We're going to talk about a lot of previews. Sam. Yes. So, upcoming releases for uh, Dungeons & Dragons. The final fifth, 2014 or 5th edition book will be coming out uh, in July 9th at LGS's and D&D Beyond. That is the Quest for the Infinite Staircase. Uh, that is the anthology book for this year. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that'll be July 9th and D uh, for LGS's and D&D Beyond with the full release one week later on July 16th. Uh, one D&D, or the 2024 revision of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Or 5.5, or 
Who Whatever. Gives a shit? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the player's handbook will be released on September 17th of this year. The Dungeon Master's Guide will be November 12th of this year, and the Monster Manual will be on February 18th of 2025. That is full release, and there will be LGS and D&D Beyond releases about two weeks before, I believe. Yeah, they did a big blowout on YouTube of a, deb- of a debut video for uh, the Player's Handbook, and they've been releasing individual videos for each of the classes, as well as feats and a crafting system as well, which is somewhat similar to the one we saw in Xanathar's, which just they're going to be tweaking it some. Uh, we're going to give some overview thoughts of that later, mm-hmm. but with Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering, Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond set will be releasing uh, this Friday, July 5th. If you are watching this on Patreon or live on TikTok, if you are watching it on the free feeds, it's already out. Yeah, you're good to go. Yeah, or don't, because maybe wait like a month. (laughs) Prices on those packs are going to crash. Yes. Uh, Next, we have Bloomboro. This will be released pre-released on July 26th with full release on August 2nd at Gen Con. Yes, very exciting. Uh, we'll get in we'll, we'll do we'll do all the release dates next we have Duskmorn House of Horrors finally have a release date for this the pre-release will be September 20th with the full release on September 27th and a brand new set and a br- surprise they went surprise shoddy surprise we're bringing back core sets except they're not called core sets anymore <laughs> yes foundations MTG foundations this will be released uh, this is a a standard set mm-hmm a five-year-long standard set that at, will at least five at least years. five. Yes, right now it is planned to twenty to last through twenty twenty nine or yeah twenty twenty nine. Days are hard. It's already years almost, are hard. By yeah. It's uh, anyway, that we're almost be, thirty. <laughs> my back, um, <laughs> my knees. Uh, that, the found M, uh, Magic Foundations will be released on November fifth of this year. Yeah, fifteenth. I can read November fifteenth. Words are hard. We're we're almost thirty. Our insight, our eyesight's going as well. So foundations we'll get into that i think that's a great idea Mm -hmm. generally speaking they probably shouldn't have gotten rid of core sets to begin with that seemed to be what started the downfall of standard as a format in general but we'll get into that Uh, a lot of people just kind of skipped over all the bloomborough shit because they did a whole lot of previews for duskmorn house of horror and they've kind of not done a lot for bloomborough yet don't know what's up with that bloomborough spoiler spoiler season starts next week yeah I'm surprised they just didn't show more at the preview panel. It seems like they kind of jumped ahead to Duskborn, and now they're going to want us to go back to Bloomboro. It's a whole... Yeah, well, I mean, uh, to be fair, to be fair, uh, Dus or Bloomboro, we have seen some of these cards since March. Yeah. Well, yeah, we saw... We saw uh, Mabel. Bloomra we... and Mabel since March. Uh, then we only got... Bria, Riptide. Bria, yeah. We yeah. got, what, a uh, new cycle of lands and a couple new other cards that we've seen uh, at, uh, what was it, MagicCon Amsterdam? Yes. Yes. Um, and so we're going to dive into those right now. So uh, we have a new cycle of uncommon lands. They all tap for a colorless, and they also tap for their land uh, color. So blue, white, black, green, red. Uh, though The colored mana can only be spent to cast a creature spell specifically. Uh, you They also all have activated abilities. Uh, we're going to go through these. What are they? Alphabetical order. Sure. Uh, Lilypad Village is a land that taps for blue. You can only spend the blue to cast a creature spell. You also have the activated ability of blue tap surveil two you can activate only if a bird frog otter or rat entered the battlefield under your control this turn uh that is a that is a a a line of text that is relatively common amongst them the specific creature types are just different uh so for the white land uh you pay one and a white to tap and sacrifice it you can look at the top six cards of your library you can reveal a bat bird mouse or rabbit card from among them put it into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order the black card is one and a black. You tap and sacrifice it to return and target bat, lizard, rat, or squirrel card from your graveyard to your hand. The green one is green and tap. You put a plus one, plus one counter on each frog, rabbit, raccoon, or squirrel you control that entered the battlefield this turn. And then red tap, you target a lizard, mouse, otter, or raccoon, and you can you control, and it gets plus one, plus oh until the end of into and gains haste until the end of turn. You can activate it only as a sorcery. So is this cycle of lands going to be particularly powerful? They're going to be very good in limited and draft for very, this set. Very good in limited and draft in this set. And they I feel like they will have a home in pre-con and low power commander decks that are creature based. Uh, I, mean, I, I think there are some. Uh, um, I think specifically the Oak Hollow Village yeah. with the squirrel uh, uh, 
uh, type in there and the mudflats will be very good in Golgari squirrels in uh, Commander. Mm -hmm. Very a very niche pack but rats. Very favorable or but very loved uh, or, uh, type mm -hmm. rats as well. I think the blue one is probably the one that would that could see the most play just from the fact that birds are very very common yeah and rats are also uh the rat tokens specifically yeah. are very common rat tokens are common bird tokens bird are tokens. very very common bird car like there's bird a lot wizard, of bird soldier uh even like birds of paradise there's bird, just a lot yep. of birds in general so it's going to be Some fops that it, I will say it is frustrating that that is one one of the few that requires a specific creature type entering the battlefield for you to activate the ability, yeah. so it's harder to activate. But Surveil 2 is also still a pretty decent keyword. Yeah, these are these are neat cards. They're not really going to see much play outside of very specific decks and outside of the limited environment for Bloomborough. Uh, maybe the Oak Hollow Village, just because plus one, plus one counter synergies. Uh, and the squirrel specific... Uh, let's see. Yeah, so that's not really going to enable a lot of the squirrel-based infinite combos that you get no. from, like, uh, Scurry Oak and that kind of stuff. But but yeah, squirrels, frogs, not, not too uncommon. No, uh, not at all. But we do we did get to see a common from each of the colors as well. We have the white common, which is an artifact food, carrot cake for one and a white, artifact food. When it enters the battlefield and when you sacrifice it, you create a one one white rabbit creature token and scry one. You can pay two to sacrifice it and gain three life. Another food synergy. <laughs> Neat, I guess. I, I'm in, I enjoy the uh, artifacts specifically that do something when they enter or leave the battlefield. Yes. Um, Making a token on that is very good, and scrying one is just nice value. Yeah, I mean, get, pay two life, or sorry, pay two mana, gain three life, common. Pay two mana, gain three life, get a rabbit and scry one. All right. That's much better. All right. Uh, it's definitely going, I, I feel like this is going to be a card that's experimented around in popper food based decks. Mm -hmm. uh, most Those are mostly Selesnia decks, oh. but... They're pretty good. Uh, we also have Early Winter, which is four and a black. It's an instant. You choose one, exile target creature, or target opponent exiles an enchantment they control. Overcost, that is draft chaff. Yeah. Yeah. That's the main thing. Uh, it's modal. It's instant speed, but f at five mana. That's the... That's... Yeah. The five mana at instant speed. Obviously, white is the premier... Uh, I... The only thing that this gives is black doesn't often have ways to get rid of enchantments. Yeah, Un and send things to exile. And send things to... The unfortunate part is you don't get to choose the enchantment. So if they have something and a roll token or something yeah. and a... And a if, they have a if they have a Ristic Study and uh, f like a Utopia Sprawl, they can be like, I'll get rid of the Utopia Sprawl. Yeah. I'll get rid of the, the Virtue... The... Oh my God. The Virtue one. Oh my God. Intangible virtue. Inter there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll it, it's it's way too overcost is the problem. If it was three mana, that's a great card. At oh a yeah, that's a oh, great card absolutely. at three mana. At four mana, I feel like you could twist it a little bit to get some play, but it's just it's especially super in black expensive. like spell slinger decks. Yeah, there's plenty of there's plenty of cost reducers, but. You know, it's a whole thing. Uh, and rituals and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Uh, we have the red card, which is Might of the Meek. It's a single red mana for an instant. Target creature gains trample until end of turn. It also gets plus one, plus oh until end of turn if you control a mouse and draw a card. This card, on the other hand, is fantastic. <laughs> uh, the cycle of one and two mana instant speed uh, red cards that give a buff and draw a card. It's a known good type of of common card in red. I mean, um, oftentimes you don't even care about the buff. You're just like, ah, oh, cool. A draw card one for mana one mana. Draw. All yeah. right. And in I, that if I pull one of these, which I hope I do, it will be going directly into Feather the Redeemed. Mm -hmm. I, of course. Target, get it back, draw a card. Trample, I think, is probably one of the better keyword abilities that this type of card gives. Yeah. A lot of them are first strike. A lot of them are haste. Uh, a lot of them are just like a plus one, plus O, oh, that kind of stuff. But Trample, mm -hmm. very, very good. And instant speed, one mana, great card. Pearl of Wisdom is the blue card. Two and a blue for a sorcery. The spell costs one less to cast. If you control an otter, draw two cards. Three mana, draw two. That's pretty on rate. That's divination, effectively. Uh, it, yeah, otter. Um, if you control an otter, that's obviously set specific. Yeah, very set specific. I mean, three mana, draw two is going to be good. Sorcery speed is what it is. Mm -hmm. Um 
it'll it'll probably get a fair amount of play. And if you just if you're if you're running like if you're playing Bria Riptide the Otter, um, auto include. Sure, I think. But yeah, if your commander itself is an Otter, obviously. Yeah. Then the green card, uh, the only creature from this common cycle or this common set of cards that they showed us, Sun Shower Druid, a w- single green mana for a zero two frog druid. When Sun Shower Druid enters, you put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature and you gain one life. And people love this card because of the art, the, the frog that's holding holding <laughs> its sta- holding its staff up and just it's you know. praise praise be. Praise, praise, be. praise the sun. Praise, people love that fucking frog. Uh, people love it. They've been putting out so many cute frogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did with the one in Ix, the poison dart frog in Ixalan. They did. Uh, oh, what was uh, the the psych the psychic, psychic fro- frog? Yeah, from uh, MH three. Thank you. Yes. And now this one. Love a, love a frog. Uh, we haven't really seen much. We're gonna hit spoiler season for Bloomborough soon. I think Bloomborough is going to be a fantastic set. Uh, Duskmorn also looks pretty cool. So let's talk about that. All right. Oh wait, no. Before we do, there's also leaks. That's I right. I apologize. We have a couple of cards that have been leaked from uh, the Bloomborough set as well, as well as a intelligent predictions for the creature types and what their color combinations are going to be. So we we can. F- Based on the cards that we've seen and some of the cards that have been leaked and some educated guesses based on those land cycles, that land cycle specifically that had the creature types attached to them, you can kind of tell what color pairs are going to be represented by each creature. Rabbits are going to be green, white. Otters, blue, red. uh, Mouse is going to be red, white. The raccoon is going to be red, green. Squirrels are black, green, obviously, as they have always been. Indeed. They're evil. But adorable at the same time, and we love them. Let's go, go, goalie. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, black, red's going to be lizard. White, blue, going to be birds. Also very, yeah. <laughs> very expected. Green, blue, going to be frogs. White, black, going to be bats. And blue, black, going to be rats. All of those make logical sense. And, yep. Yeah. Yep. It's fine. Here but for it. the spoilers. We have Ral, Crackling Wit, which is a two- Blue red for a legendary planeswalker, Rao. It's going to be a mythic rare. It is a static ability. Whenever you cast a non creature spell, you put a loyalty counter on Rao Crackling Wit. It has a starting loyalty of four. It also has a plus one for creature, uh, creature, a create. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, they did a type up of this card because it's kind of like a dingy thing. They just totally bunked it up. It's plus one to create a one, one blue and red otter creature token with prowess. Ayo. Love that keyword. Big fan of that keyword. Ooh. Okay. Well, now that I look at it, I might need to. <laughs> I might need to put that in Narset. I mean, it's another. It gets count. It gets loyalty counters on non-creature spells. Narset likes non-creature spells. It creates one-one prowessy tokens. I mean, I like prowess in that deck. It's a good time. Anyway, my, <laughs> minus three, draw three cards. Discard two. And minus 10, draw three cards. You get an emblem with instant and sorcery spells. You cast have storm that is redonkulous so i want to i want to point out a little a little a fun little thing here you cast this planeswalker for four mana you plus one it it's at five loyalty Mm -hmm. let's say you then cast a cantrip it's at six loyalty yeah next turn Cast a spell, cast a spell, cast a spell, cast a spell. Non-creatures. They can be one mana. You have at least four mana open because you cast the Planeswalker to begin with. It's a ten mana. You can then immediately minus ten to draw three cards and then all your instant sorcery has to have Storm. Yep. Ability that you can't interact with because it's an emblem. Yeah, that's a pretty good ultimate. Yeah. uh, For a four mana Planeswalker with four starting loyalty, it's got a static ability that's going to give it more counters. In addition to a plus one, a very useful minus three of draw Draw three, three. put two back to the yard. And then a phenomenal ultimate of minus ten, draw three, and get a very powerful emblem. Yeah. It's not even even like, oh, I've, I've done all this work to get to the emblem, and now I don't have anything in my hand. No, I'm refilling my hand, and now I have... Yes. All right, here we go. Here we go. Literally, you're ca- if you're casting enough non-creature spells that you're able to get them to 10 loyalty, then you're very e- you, you've just dumped your hand out. You get 3 back and a, an exceptionally powerful emblem that's going to make every instant sorcery you cast for the rest of your game regardless of if Ral is around. Yeah. Exceptionally powerful. Um and on turn 1, you're going to get a 1/1 prowessy blocker. So 
Seems like a very good planeswalker. It does. All things considered. I'm very excited for that one. The other spoiled card or leaked card is Parting Gust. It is white, white for an instant. Gift a tapped fish. Stay with me here. <laughs> Stay with me. That is that is the card text. Yes. The reminder text for that says, you may promise an opponent a gift as you cast the spell. If you do, they create a tapped 1-1 one, one blue fish creature token before its other effects. What? <laughs> ah, so let me explain. This is kicker. Kicker. Kicker, where you give your opponents a, a, a token. So this is effectively kicker. Lincoln's going to hate that. <laughs> so this is effectively kicker. He said kind of sarcastically. Anyway, exile target non-token creature. So it's a white, white, instant exile non-token creature at worst. Yeah. Okay. White, white, remove. White, white, instant exile non-token creature. If you gift the 1-1 one, one tapped blue fish, if it, or sorry, if the gift wasn't promised, return that creature to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one, plus one counter on on it at the beginning of the end step so this is a really interesting not it's not actually modal but modal card it is it's modal without saying choose yeah so it is either a two mana exile removal for a non-token creature and you're probably going to give that person the tapped one one fish it's the same concept as you know pongify or hi- rapid hybridization or gift yes. uh, or a uh, generous, generous gift. gift or beast within that whatever you're giving them Especially a 1-1 one, one tapped fish. That's nothing. Liter- in fact, in terms of that style of effect, it feels like it's a better generous gift. Oh, absolutely. Your generous gift is three mana. You get a th- they, you give them a 3-3 three, three untapped elephant. Uh, they're both instant speed. The only downside is parting gust is two white pips. Yeah. As opposed to two in white. But... I think this is going to be a great card, and if you have a lot of ETBs in your deck, you can uh, not gift the fish and then just blink your own thing Yeah, and get an ETB trigger off of it. So that's a very good card. It's uncommon, so you're probably going to see it if you're opening up a fair bit of packs. Yeah. I, th- I would like to see it as well, because that would definitely be going in Abdel Adrian. Gorian's Ward. Gorian's Ward. And Candlekeep Sage. It's, my, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorite decks. Fair enough. It's my most powerful casual deck. Quote, unquote, casual deck. <laughs> It's fine. It's a good, it's a very good card. Yes. Lastly, I think I said there were only two. There's actually three. We lied to you. I apologize. I apologize greatly. But it is a legendary land. You have three tree city. It is a legendary land that says as three tree city enters, you choose a creature type. You can tap to add a colorless mana or you can pay two and tap to choose a color. Add an amount of mana of that color equal to the number of creatures you control of the chosen type. Mm -hmm. So, mass mana. We don't know what rarity it is because of the quality of the photograph. I would imagine this is a mythic or a rare. I would imagine, yeah, as, as well. So, this is a Gaia's Cradle type effect mixed with Nykthos Shrine to Nyx. Yeah, Nykthos, a uh, Cabal Coffers. Yes. Um... How do, you, how do you think it compares to Nykthos or Cabal Coffers? I think this is decidedly not as good I as agree. Nykthos. I agree. Um, can be better than Cabal Coffers, asterisk, if Cabal Coffers is not in a mono black deck. <laughs> yeah, Cabal Coffers really, really shines in the mono black deck. Yeah, once you start you know, splashing in other utility lands, multicolored lands, non-swamps. Yeah. Uh, which is why the Urbor combo with Cabal Coffers is just so powerful. Yes. But yeah, here... It is less powerful than both of than both Nykthos, or uh, it's less powerful than Nykthos, Gaia's Cradle, and Cabal Coffers, but at the same time, it's more powerful than a lot of other lands mm-hmm. that people are going to be including in their decks. I like that it does not enter tapped yeah. as well. Uh, you're always going to be able to tap it for colorless, much like Nykthos, and it is effectively a three mana cost to activate the ability. So if you control three or more of the same type of creature, like if you're running a creature type deck yeah. that matter, even a non-creature type deck that just happens to be like a lot of wizards or yeah. a lot of humans or whatever, if you, as long Those as you really can, common creature types, exactly. Like even, even in my Narset and Lightened Exile deck, there's a lot of humans. There's a lot of monks. There's a lot of wizards. And if you go through and you figure out what your creature type combinations are, you can figure out what cards 
you are going to be playing most frequently and you can choose a creature type accordingly and still net positive on mana because you only need four of the same creature type Mm -hmm. of the chosen type for it to net positive. Yeah. Um, Which, if you have token generators, that is very important. If you're running a creature type deck, that is very important. Um, Not as powerful as Gaius Cradle, but... What nothing's will be? Quite, no, yeah, nothing's quite Gaius Cradle. What will be? I think this is going to see a fair bit of play. Um, I imagine this is a mythic. It has to be a mythic. I feel right? it's got to be a mythic. But it might be a rare. We might get lucky. We might get lucky. It might be a rare. It's a legendary land, so thankfully you're only going to be able to have one on the on the field at a time. Which in Commander you would have anyway, but in other formats. I don't think this is going to see much play outside Commander personally. I mean, that level of mana acceleration is great, but you're going to need at least four of a creature type. And it has to be the type that you yeah. chose, and then you're only netting one mana positive on the exchange. Yeah. So it in in standard and modern, I feel like the, the formats go a little bit too fast. It's also in those formats, the, the typos, the, uh, or kindred or whatever you want to call them nowadays, uh, those are far less common in other yes. formats. Like, yeah, I watch Canlander, and... Uh, and one of the guys got made fun of. He's like, this is my ninjas deck. Cause, and there were only five ninjas in the deck. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's that's how these formats are played, is where the flavor is these small amount of cards that I get because yes. everything else is kind of necessary. Yeah. In black, hand attacks are necessary. In blue, counter spells are necessary. And yeah, all that sort of thing. All right. So that is all. We, do you have anything you want to say about Bloomborough? Do uh, we, we have do any have questions? Bloomborough specific question, which Ooh. is from Eddie MTG asks, what's your thoughts on the artwork for Bloomborough looking AI? Uh, here's the thing. A, I think for one, I think some people are really bad at picking out what AI art actually is. Um, all of the regular cards look fine to me. Mm-hmm. It's the, it's the weird frames that you're getting on stuff. Um, I think that's just an artistic choice. Wizards is not so, so stupid to make, oh, let's make, let's make AI looking art for our cards. <laughs> I think it's just a bit busy. That's fair. You know? Yeah. I'm, I'm one of those people who's really bad at, uh, identifying if something is AI art, unless it's like AI art specifically. Like, yeah. You gotta look at hands. You gotta look at hands. And, uh, I don't know. They've, they've, they've said so much they put out so much uh press recently about reaffirming their stance on not doing ai art for their um physical products and with wizards of the coast leadership change recently like we gotta hope they're not stupid enough to yeah. try to slip one past the community at this time yeah i can see them in like two years trying to like scooch it in there and probably getting uh pushed back again but i can i can see them being like hey we're gonna we're going to we're going to use a license for this AI app. If, they, if they're going to do that kind of thing, they need to be like, hey, we're using this system. Like if they were like, oh, we're using Photoshop because the Adobe, as much as you might not like it, it is in their licensing agreement now that if you're using Photoshop, anything you make in Photoshop can be used to train their AI algorithm. And they are logging and keeping track of all of the art assets that they purchase and license for use in AI art in their AI training algorithm. And if they were like, hey, for the tokens or for whatever, like un less important stuff we're just gonna generate some ai images just to put on there i feel like that would have to be something they'd have to proactively disclose and get ahead of yeah before they'd be able to like actually do that kind of a thing that being said tokens for example are one of the like it's entry level uh, magic artist stuff yeah but it also beloved by the community oh yeah like going to token obviously tokens because they're the easiest thing and like you know people can't really just create recreate full cards um, but yeah, tokens, you go to a con, you, those are the oh, things yeah. you can commonly buy. I did make a joke once, and I, now now I keep thinking oh, about that. In your that entire joke. life? <laughs> yeah, one joke in my entire life, uh, that I wanted to do a, a TCG that was all AIR generated, but it would just be photographs I go and take, put feed into the AIR <laughs> generator. Just, just from zero, I just go take a million photos and feed them in and then tell it what I want. And so that, training just, your own AI model. Yeah. And then it's like, well, this is AI art. Yes, but it's only art that I, it's only my stuff. It's only, it's only pictures that it's I've taken really of my. It's only really shitty fit photos. I mean, that would be, that, I would love to see what that would generate. Have you seen the people that have been doing motion AI for like memes? 
yeah. recently. Like the the classic like ooh, like the guy looking back and he's holding the girlfriend's hand and the girlfriend's like, what the fuck are you doing? And then it's like the other girl walking by. Now they've made that like a motion image and it starts as the meme and then the guy starts turning around and walking and then the girlfriend is like chasing. I'm like, oh my God, this shit is horrifying. Oh yeah, I've seen the a whole, a whole series of uh, if the time traveler is going to stop memes <laughs> and it's like yeah the same thing where the meme starts and then they're like they see something off camera and then just run yeah. I've seen and uh, running is horribly freaky oh, I can't remember what the starting meme was but the motion started and then the AI morphed into a Rick the Rick Astley music video and I was like oh my god I just got Rick rolled <laughs> by a non Rick rolling meme this is ridiculous <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I'm definitely seeing some questions rolling. They'll be good for the end, so stick around till then. Ooh, please do. And now so, let's go on to Duskmorn. Duskmorn House of Horror. We now have a release date for pre-release September 20th, with the full release September 27th. Got a lot of cards shown for this. Uh, we got to see the beautiful full art lands. I, I like know. these. They're very, they're very gothic and horror and fantastic. Uh, leading. Just, never mind. That was a dumb joke. I was gonna say just like the women I like. Oh, hey, hey, yo. I mean. Fair. So we two cards that they showed in this preview event that we had leaked in the last week before the preview event, but since the posting of the last podcast have been uh, Enduring Tenacity and Overlord of the Haunt Woods, but we'll get into those. Those are officially revealed cards now. So we'll start with the Overlord of the Haunt Woods. It is three green green for a six five avatar horror enchantment creature with impending four for one green green impending four is a new keyword ability okay reminder text it's a paragraph it's a paragraph of reminder text guys if you cast this spell for its impending cost it enters with four time counters and isn't a creature until the last is removed at the beginning of your end step remove a time counter from it so you're removing time counters at the end step now don't they usually get time counters are usually removed on upkeep yeah so Got to keep track of that now. Why it isn't upkeep? I, I don't know. I think it should be upkeep, but I digress. It's it's a really interesting like you're not going. It's going to become become a creature eventually. Eventually, but you're not going to be able to use that creature the first turn. It's a creature unless you can move the time counter some other way. Doctor Who's cards example. There's um. Oh my God. What's the uh the Glissa. The black oh, and green yeah. that, that removes Glissa. counters. There's also a um a you can move Marchesa on the back of the on the back of a uh mm-hmm. battle goldberry. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's ways to move counters around, but on its base it's a five mana six five, and the ability is Whenever Overlord of the Haunt Woods enters or attacks, you create a tapped colorless land token named Everywhere. That is every basic land type. This is a mythic, by the way. That's a redonkulous A token ability. land. A token rainbow land. Yeah. So three mana. So this is effectively three mana. You get the land. This is a three mana perfect ramp spell. Yeah. In a way. And then later, you'll be able to ramp more as you are attacking with this creature. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you cast it for its impending cost. Um, that is very powerful in a lot of formats. It immediately turns on domain. Yes, it it's only it's only three mana for that. And like you said, we can move counters around, or you can just have it sit on the battlefield. Not because be it's creature. just an enchantment that doesn't do anything until it is a creature. So this is you're you're kind of banking mana in a way and generating more mana for an additional la- an additional mana every turn until it's on the battlefield, and then you're just getting more mana out of it. And it's only five mana. You I, can for just for a creature, yeah. If you just, just want to cast it as the creature. You can ramp up to five mana very quickly in a lot of formats. You can pitch this to the yard and reanimate it as a creature for very easily. Like this, there's, there's uh, the new Eldamri from Modern Horizons Three, yes. where you can just tap to put a creature on. You pay a green tap and three creatures and put it on the battlefield. That's not even to get into Exhum Reanimate, mm-hmm. uh, 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 Dread Return. There's plenty of cards that are going to be getting things out of the graveyard that are going to be cheating creatures into play, and it's already a five mana six five. That gets that gets you a rainbow land every time it attacks. Mm-hmm. That is redonkulous. Very powerful. And the art is terrifying. <laughs> it is. Oh, I think it's so cool. It's very creepy. It's like a moth, but also has like he- weird legs put sticking out of it. It's gross. 
It's gross and I love it in every way. <laughs> so we got a couple other mythics to talk about. We got a red mythic. It is a non-legendary creature. Two and a red for a 3-3 three, three creature spirit. It is called Screaming Nemesis. It has haste. And whenever it is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to any other target. If a player is dealt damage this way, they can't gain life for the rest of the game. I didn't know that life gain decks were running so rampant. I know, right? We really needed a three mana answer to life gain. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this set, this turns off a lot of powerful combos in your Aether Flux Reservoir, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Uh, what's the... Heliod what's, and Walking Ballista. What's the mono black drain and gain? Sanguine Blood Bond? Sanguine Blood, yeah. Uh, sanguine Bond and Exquisite Blood. Uh, their Blood Artist effects. Blood like, artist. Any kind of looping blood effect blood like blah, that. Blah. But a three mana three three with haste is good. It's yeah. on. It's on rate. Yes, it's dealing. It's basically if it deals damage, or wh- if it is dealt damage. So if you're able to give it indestructible, if you're able to give it a bigger booty with an aura or something, got a pinger, and then it's going to deal that same amount of damage to anything else. And you can basically turn like if it gets dealt damage three times, if you have your own things that are pinging it for one, you can ping your opponents for one and make sure they can't gain life again. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be very great in group slug decks. Yeah. Very great in group slug decks. This is going to be very good in group burn decks as well. Uh, There's plenty, there's plenty of cards that, or there's plenty of red based decks that are going to be dealing damage to opponents and gaining you life at the same time. And this is just going to make them better because your opponents aren't going to be able to recover from that as easily. It's another Stuffy Doll. I love any version of Stuffy Doll. Stuffy Doll is great. Stuffy Doll is a good time. Stuffy Doll is a good time. The other <laughs> mythic that we have seen, and this is interesting, we have another Planeswalker turned creature. Desparked Planeswalker. Desparked wander- the Wandering Rescuer. We still don't know her name. Nope. <laughs> still don't know her name, but... She is a 5-mana, 3-4, legendary creature, human, samurai, noble. It's 3 white, white, has flash and convoke, so you can tap your creatures to reduce it by 1 generic or 1 mana of that creature's color. It ha- she has double strike, and other tapped creatures you control have hexproof. This seems like a very just value creature in oh, a lot absolutely. of ways. Oh, absolutely. A lot of protect, obviously getting it in at any time. Being able to convoke it, which means, oh, you have that that thing that you need to keep, you need to give hexproof to. Well, it can help you pay for that cost. Yes. The double strike is just uh, icing on the cake. Mm-hmm. It, it, she becomes a very good blocker as a double striking three four. Uh, you can instant speed is great. Convoke is great. Convoke enabling the hexproof. I didn't even think about. Yeah. That's a very that's very powerful. Is like you can at instant speed and reducing and appearing to not have a lot of open mana. Yeah, and be able to get hexproof in at instant speed is very very powerful. You can also over convoke things, so you don't. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You're not limited to convoking with five creatures. You can convoke your entire board of like eight, ten tokens if you wanted, and you just get them tapped, and then they gain hexproof uh, as a benefit to that. I think she's going to be a very good value piece. I don't see her really as a commander. No, in I a agree. lot of ways, uh, I think it's I think it's fun to have a commander that has flash and convoke in the command zone because mm-hmm. that that then became, becomes kind of a mind game for a lot of your opponents. Uh, but her abilities on her card aren't like it's you're basically just trying to say I would like a a less powerful Teferi's protection in the command zone, mm-hmm. and that's just a little bit too niche. But as a part of the ninety nine, I think she's going to be very powerful. I think she's going to see a home in uh, humans decks in modern and, mm. and standard and stuff as well because hexproof and double strike convoke flash like those are just great keywords. Oh yeah, to have on a card. I agree. Uh, do you have any specific say? Oh, we do need to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a new ley line. There's going to be a cycle of ley lines. We don't know what they all are yet. We've seen the white one, which is two white, white for an enchantment. If it's in your opening hand, you can begin with it on the battlefield. Uh, if you would gain life, you gain that much life plus one. And as long as you have at least seven life more than your starting life total, creatures you control get plus two, plus two. It's a less power. It's it's a very casual ley line. Yeah, uh, it's gonna go great in your life gain decks, Soul Sisters, Heliod, whatever. Uh, a little bit niche, but fun. So we get a new ley line cycle, which will be exciting as well. Uh, I'm more intrigued by what the other ley lines will be, but we got a big boy we need to talk about. Yeah, the Doomsday Excruciator. It is a six mana six six creature demon. Six mana. 
you might be like, oh, a six mana six six, that's fair. It's black, 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 black. It is a six black pip creature. Pip creature. <laughs> We're so sorry for those of you who were not expecting weird ASMR today. <laughs> it's it's a thing. It's the only creature that has six black pips on it. Yeah. The first. Um, we've had, like, the, the was it Phyrexian? The for, uh, oh, yes. Phyrexian Obliterator. Yes, the Phyrexian Obliterator, and which is four black pips. Phyrexian. There's another one that's four white pips. Yes. Yes. Vindicator. Vindicator, yes. And uh, there's other, there's a six green pip uh, dinosaur. Um uh, there's a five green pip one. That's the ten ten mm. for five green. Uh, anyway, Doomsday Excruciator. Six mana, six, six with flyer. With flying is a flyer. <laughs> when Doomsday Excruciator enters, if it was cast, each player exiles all but the bottom six cards of their library face down. At the beginning of your upkeep, draw a card. This is wacky. This is a we are finishing this game very soon. Whether it's I'm decking myself or you guys need, you guys have a six turn clock effectively. This in combination with, so for one, it exiles most of the library face down. Face down is particularly important because then players can't just riffle through their exile zone and then to kind of try and figure out what the six cards they have left are. Yeah. So they might be stuck with nothing. They might be stuck with something exceptionally powerful that they might want to dig for. They might want to just slow play it and try and get everyone else to deck themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, This just kind of immediately flips the dynamic of the game. And then you are going to be drawing through your cards faster as well. Um, It's an interesting game ender that I, that while it feels powerful, I feel like in practice, you're just setting yourself up to lose by decking. I will say there are several cards. Obviously, in you're not if you're pro, if you're playing this, you're probably not in blue. Hopefully, you're probably in mono black. Hopefully not. Um, so you're not having access to Lab Man. You're not having access to Thoracle. Uh, I guess there are a couple of options. One uh, I can't remember its name, but there is a enchantment from the Necrons precon mm-hmm. that says if you would draw a card but instead have no cards in your library, you may play a creature from your graveyard. If you cannot do that, then you lose the game. Yeah. Um, the second thing is black also has a lot of access to target player draws a card or yes. target player draws X cards. So once, and, and so my guess, my guess is here, if, you, if you're going to play this, you're on one, want to have already most of your gr- library in your graveyard. Yeah. Two, you want to have access to those spells to have people draw multiple cards in a turn. And three, you're going to be in mono black. Yeah. Um, also, also, necrodominance and necropotence are a thing. Yeah. To skip your own draw step. So you'll be able, through the use of those two cards, you will be able to get those six cards that are left in your library into your hand through exi- through the exiling clauses of those cards. And then you're skipping your draw step, so you're not going to deck yourself. Yeah, you just got to get this off the field as well. Exactly. If you can, if you have a Necrodominance or a Necropotence in play, and then you cast Doomsday Excruciator, you are much... They, suddenly, the, the Necrodominance, Necropotence is a high-value removal target yeah. for your opponents. And if they don't have enchantment removal in their hand or luck into the last six cards of their library being a piece of enchantment removal, yeah. you win the game. It's on, it's on a bit of a delay if you can keep your life total up, but you, can, you are more effectively going to be able to win the game. Uh, I could see this in Rakdos decks specifically. Mm. Um that lean heavily into black mana. That's fair. Yeah. Do specifically to um, Underworld Breach. Uh, that's fair. Yeah. And then being able to escape cast cards in your grave. Like if you're, if you're dumping a bunch of stuff into your graveyard and then are able to Underworld Breach and use this, even if this is in the graveyard, it only requires you to be casting it. That's true. So if you're Underworld Breaching and escaping your Doomsday Excruciator and casting it for six black mana you're still casting it so you still get that trigger and you're going to exile all the libraries um it is very interesting and it feels to me like something that people are going to read and be like this is very very powerful and then they're going to play it and they're going to be like oh 
this isn't nearly as powerful as mm-hmm. I thought it would be. And now also I'm screwing myself unless they're specifically planning the line of how they're going to play it. There's also the possibility that you just entomb and reanimate this. And then at worst, it's a six, six uh, Phyrexian arena that doesn't ping you. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. That is true. That is true. Reanimating it and just being able to draw two cards every turn as a, with a 6-6 six, six flyer, I think, is still very valuable. That may, That's a very good point. Yeah. Well, Cursed Recording is actually another interesting one right here. Uh, it's right next to Doomsday. Excruciator is why I remembered it. It's two and red. Two, two, it's two and two red for an artifact. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a time counter on Cursed Recording. Then, if there are seven or more time counters on it, remove all the counters and it deals 20 damage to you. Tap, when you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell. You may choose targets for the co- new targets for the copy. So, on its face, it looks like it's a pretty major downside for any spell slinger deck. Uh, that being said, it does have some interesting uh, possibilities in uh, uh, permanent exchange decks, mm-hmm. where, uh, like, um, oh, what's the Jeskai one? The Jeskai Minotaur... Zedru, mm-hmm. Zedru. Mm-hmm. All right, well, I'll give all all cast all cast uh, six instants or sorceries. Here you go, cast an instant or sorcery. Deal you, yourself twenty you're, damage. You're also going to be able to tap it and get some copy value yeah. and then send it away. Um, it also like if something is making you sacrifice a permanent, it's good there. It seems it, around time counters like we were saying earlier. It's an interesting. That is a, such a massive downside, and I have to. Th- I'm, and I, my immediate thought is, how can I turn damage against myself into damage to everyone? There is this was this is a very specific line. Um, Pariah's shield. It's an artifact or it's equipment that says uh, when damage will be dealt to you, have that damage dealt to the equipped creature instead. So you equip Pariah's shield to Stuffy Doll, mm. or or uh, Brash Taunter, or whatever that other thing was. Yeah. The 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 screaming nemesis. The line, the lines for using this thing are very specific. Um, but four mana tap to copy any instant and sorcery you cast every turn is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and if you're in a deck that is going to incidentally be casting instants and sorceries as opposed to a spell slinger deck, I think this is much better. Yeah. Than spell slinger because getting around that twenty damage to yourself is going to be a bit of a challenge unless you're building that specifically. Ooh, what about um, Greven decks where where the his power is equal to something plus the amount of damage dealt to you this turn? Hmm. Possibly. I think this I think this card is going to be a little niche, but it's going to find some pretty cool homes when it does. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, just uh, some quick little overviews here. We got comeback wrong, um, which is just a funny name. <laughs> Two and a black for a sorcery. Destroy target creature. If a creature card is put into a graveyard this way, return to the battlefield under your control and sacrifice it at the beginning of your next end step. So you're destroying a creature, you're getting it for a turn, and then it goes away. So as three mana sorcery, I think that is a very good removal spell in black. That's a very oh, efficient yeah. removal spell, and it's going to get you a lot of upside on it as well. It's a rare, and it's going to see a lot of play. Uh, chainsaw, one and a red. It's an artifact equipment. When it enters, it deals three damage up to one target creature. So, at worst, it's a two mana lightning bolt. It's a two mana lightning strike to a creature. Yeah. Uh, whenever whenever one or more creatures die, you put a rev counter on the chainsaw, and then equipped creature gets plus X plus O, or X is the number of rev counters on the chainsaw. It has equipped three as well. That's pretty fun. It's a fun. It's a fun equipment. I don't think it. It it'll. It'll be it'll be pretty good in some Boros equipment decks. I think yeah, there's a it'll lot of fun. equipment that it could easily be swapped out for where it's not necessarily better, it's not necessarily worse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We are getting delirium returning. Uh, fear of the fear of missing out is one and a red for a two three enchantment creature nightmare. Whenever it enters, you discard a card and draw a card and has delirium. Whenever fear of missing out attacks for the first time each turn, if you have four or more card types among cards in your graveyard, you untap the attacking, you untap attacking, you, oh my god, untap target creature. After this phase, there's an additional combat phase. So an additional combat through delirium Pretty on cool. a two mana, two, three body that loots you. I like how it's foam. It's it's an interesting take on FOMO. It's <laughs> right. <laughs> It's something. Uh, we also got to see a legendary creature with Toby, Beastie Befriender. Two and a white for a 1-1 one, one legendary human wizard. It's a little guy. Just a little guy. A little guy with this horrifying abomination. But 
Whenever Toby, Beastie Befriender, enters, create a 4-4 white beast creature token with this creature can't attack or block alone. As long as you control four or more creature tokens, creature tokens you control have flying. Perfect. Great little flicker target, huh? Sure. <laughs> Thankful. It's interesting. You would think that this is the kind of thing that would create a, uh, a legendary, legendary token, yeah. but it doesn't. No. So. And it, and it want, I mean... It doesn't even necessarily need you to have the be- the the little the beastie there for it to, have, to give your token creature tokens flying. You could just have like three one one soldiers and this guy. Yeah, it would be it would be fun to build this as a commander, but I think that would just be a very casual deck. I think it will go it will go pretty neat in some in the ninety nine of a lot of oh, creature absolutely. a lot of token based decks. I mean, three mana one one that gives you a four four body, so it's a three mana five five across two bodies. The 4-4 has to attack or block with something else. And then all of your tokens have flying. So, is this a play on Monsters, Inc.? It kind of looks like the guy, the the bad guy, or like a combination of Sully and Randall from Monsters, Inc. I like. hate that. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. Uh, no, that's pretty cool. Uh, lastly, the other spoiled card. The other spoiled card, Enduring Tenacity. Enduring Tenacity. It's two black black for a 4-3 enchantment creature, Snake Glimmer. A glimmer. I don't think I've ever heard that. I as don't a think I've heard before. that as a creature type either. So it's that's the thing. Whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. Great. That goes infinite with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that goes infinite with a lot of things. Uh we talked about Exquisite Blood Sanguine Bond earlier. Yeah. And there's there's plenty of these types of effects. It also has whenever when Enduring Tenacity dies. If it was a creature, return to the battlefield under its owner's control as an enchantment and not a creature. That's removal protection <laughs> on it as well. This is... <laughs> okay, yeah, it has to die. <laughs> it sure. has to die. But like, still, it could, be it, could, it could be... But that's... A board wipe doesn't get rid of this most of the time. Mm-hmm. Your targeted removal to you blocking... A, it's, a good, it's a decent blocker. It's a great blocker. It is a great blocker that is going to enable a lot of combos. And also just incidental life gain draining people is still pretty good. I will say, I do not like the 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 art slash frame for for the Enduring Tasty and Overlord of the Haunts would for the specific reason of the way the text looks. Yeah. Uh so I think it's I think it's actually good to talk about some of the alternate arts. So we have the showcase versions of these cards and we're going to get a, a couple of different card uh, uh frame types we're obviously going to get the extended arts which we're used to and the showcase arts are going to come in several different varieties we get to see like this tv vhs like art like evil dead and yeah and Night of the living dead era style frame frame it's neat uh it's another one of those like ah, oh, it's really hard to tell what color that card is <laughs> yeah much like how the the murders of karlov manor case frames made everything look like they were a white card yeah um we're getting uh we get to see toby beastie befriender is going to have a uh a commander uh profile card art, yeah but it's not cool. but it's not in that typical kind of sketch uh or like painting art this is like a interesting 3d it's kind of spooky spooky ghosty kind of thing yeah um and then overlord of the haunt woods and the enduring tenacity they have like a frame break card almost but it's not really breaking the frame it's very it's more like minimal frame yeah in a lot of ways and the art's gonna go all the way to the edge of the card itself and there's basically no shading or anything on the back of the text to make it a bit more readable. So it's going to be a little hard to read. Uh, my biggest issue, uh, the Wandering Rescuer, there's a foil one that, I mean, it's it's your standard kind of uh, extended art mm-hmm. ec- fancy thing. Uh, there's also another art style that is all black with a little bit of red. Um, again, a white, uh, the, the Wandering Rescuer is a white card that if you look at it, everything is indicating to you that it's a black card. Yeah. I find that a little bit annoying, but that's just kind of me. It reminds me of almost a combination of um, double feature with the ink art from Frexia Obi-Wan. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. 
that looks pretty that i mean it does look pretty cool uh, we got plenty of borderless things as well oh and a promo card is the twitching doll it's a two mana mana dork that's disgusting and it's a spider you can sacrifice it to create a green spider yeah for every nest t- counter that you have on it and every time you tap it for a man of any color it gets a nest counter on it so yeah two mana two two mana dork that's going to give you some upside later if someone if if it's going to be removed you can just tap it and make a bunch of spiders but anyway anything you want to say about duskmorn house of horror i'm looking forward to this set i think it'll be real fun it's going to um, have a lot of cool pieces i like the i like the flavoring of bloomborough more personally i'm not a huge horror person it's not that it scares me i just find it most of it like way too campy I mean, just not, a like, portion of the genre is has involved to be that. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah. All right. All right. The last set. We got a brand new set announcement with Magic the Gathering Foundations. They called this the set. If they made... They were like, what if we made a Magic the Gathering set that was called Magic the Gathering? Mm-hmm. This is their attempt at revitalizing standard. Again. Again. <laughs> it's going to come out on November 15th and is going to be in standard and standard legal through at least 2029. Yeah. So this might be in standard for longer. This might just be like a permanent fixture and they're just going to do new foundation sets that are just permanent fixtures in standard yeah. for all we know. We don't know. But it's going to include some new cards as well as some very notable reprints the first of which is lana war elves yeah. single green for a one one elf druid that taps for a green mana good old lana war elves lana war elves elvish mystic findhorn elves they're all the same and they are all very good in standard yeah one mana mana dorks are powerful especially in green uh we also are getting a reprint of day of judgment two white white for a sorcery that destroys all creatures Nice little valuable board wipe. Nothing wrong with a board wipe. The last reprint that we have seen so far is Omniscience. Another (laughs) card that has zero standard shenanigans available to it. (laughs) Seven blue, blue, blue for a enchantment that says you may cast spells from your hand without paying their mana costs. Vexing Bobble went up in price again. (laughs) Shocker, right? Uh, We also have been shown two new cards. We have a Selesnia card, Anthem of Champions. It's green and a white for an enchantment where creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Very basic Anthem effect that in a standard or a limited environment is very good. Yeah. Uh, We also have a play on Nine Lives. Uh, Nine Lives Familiar. Two black black for a 1-1 cat. When it it enters with eight revival counters on it, if you cast it. When this creature dies, if it has a revival count, if it has, if it had a revival counter on it, Jesus, I cannot (laughs) fucking talk today. It's a, it's a little bit of a wall of text. So it is. When this creature dies, if it had a revival counter on it, return it to the battlefield with one fewer revival counter on it at the beginning of the next end step. So a one man or a three mana one one that is going to take eight things to remove it <laughs> permanently. My my nine things to remove it permanently. Duh, my, nine lives. My interest in this uh, comes obviously. I don't play much standard, uh, but something like I don't know in commander. I have a Phyrexian Arena, and I have this. Or not a Phyrexian Arena, a Phyrexian... An altar of some sort. I can sack this nine times in one turn, generate nine to 18 mana. You get it back You get it back at the beginning uh, of the next end step. So it doesn't come back Well, still, that's two free mana a turn. Yeah. Effectively, and if you have a Blardist, or if you have anything like that... I like this in a more casual sense of this is going to be the perfect fuel for your Corrupted Conviction, your Deadly Dispute, your low cost instants and sorceries that require you to sacrifice a creature as an additional cost Ooh, victimize Victim- exactly all those cards are going to now have nine instances of effectively you get nine sacrifices for three mana yeah so i think that'll be that'll i don't know how well it will play in standard i think it's going to enable some of those uh sacrifice a creature as an additional cost cards a bit more uh, but those are the only five cards that we have seen from this set. Uh, I It's going to include a lot of just staple reprints, so card prices are going to end up going down, which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. This is effectively what they did, used to do with core sets every year. And then they got rid of doing core sets every year, and now standard's not as popular anymore. Isn't yeah. that interesting, how that happens? I mean, at the same really time, it's, it's been an evolution of, of eternal formats have been picking up more uh, more interest in the past several years um 
because one of standard domain issues, which they are now trying to eliminate with this. And last year when they announced that they were going from two year rotations to three year rotations, is that ro- is your is your as uh, I've heard them co- colloquially called rotatos? Mm-hmm. It's like okay, um, November whatever when I, August is that when they rotate out? Yeah. It's like okay, August is coming up. Now I have to go through this deck and find out what I need to pull out. I have to go through this. Uh, that's just, just every rotating format in a way. But that's now that's why eternal formats often have a lot of popularity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think having a pool of cards that won't be rotating out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The last magic thing we're going to talk about is a, a breaking news for local game stores. There's a new promo card that you'll be able to get starting July 5th. If you're watching this on free feeds, you can get it now at your local game store by participating in a Modern Horizons 3 draft or purchasing three Modern Horizons booster packs. Uh, you can get a promo of Sakura Tribe Elder. Steve. Elder. Steve. For those of you that don't know what Steve does, if you get the promo, you'll get a one in a green card (laughs) so the promo doesn't have power toughness or its ability on it or its creature type or the fact that it is a creature on it so you need to know what steve does it's a creature that you can sacrifice it to search your library for a basic land and put it on the battlefield tapped yeah that's all it is it's a two mana ramp spell people use it as a creature to block sometimes it's mostly just two mana it stays on the battlefield you sacrifice it on the opponent's end step and you get a card you get a land on the battlefield tapped that's all it is. Uh, but it's a it's a staple. It's used in a ton of decks. You're going to be able to get a cool, full art, textless version of it as a as a promo card. And I think that's pretty fun. Sure. So, Love it. That is the last bit of news we have for Match of the Gathering, but, which would normally be enough for the podcast. But here we are. <laughs> Once again. Yeah. <sighs> Wizards of the Coast has been uh, talking a lot about the revision to 5th edition and the new player's handbook yeah. for D&D. Um, they have released a video on every single class and feats and spells and, uh, crafting and a ton of other shit. We are not going to be able to talk about all of them, much like how we are not able to talk about everything from the magic previews. And those kinds of things are just going to start coming up, uh, on, on other podcasts and just everything. Yes. But... We're going to give a couple of our overview thoughts about the class-specific stuff from uh, the revision to 5th edition. Uh, First and foremost, all subclasses are going to be level 3. Yeah, this was announced back when they first started putting out uh, the UAs. And man, there there was a lot of discussion in the community. Um, some people arguing that the old way, the 2014 way, was better because, like, for clerics and for uh, wizards, like, oh, you would know these things earlier. Whereas the other, and I think uh, the side I'm on is, yeah, just kind of standardize it across the board so yeah. that you're all kind of on the same page. It it becomes it becomes one of those you're when you're getting subclasses at different levels, you're swinging wildly mm-hmm. the power level of cards at different le- at different levels of play. Yes, um, and. It just having it standardized across the board is just going to be more convenient for most players. It's going to be also most m- more convenient for a DM with a new table of players. Yeah, when it's like, okay, this turn, this this level up, this is what we are doing. This yes. is what you're getting. Everybody selects their subclass now. Mm-hmm. Everybody gets their ability score improvement. Everybody is getting a subclass feature. This that kind of stuff. Yeah. And note, all of the classes only get four subclasses, mm-hmm. and they all get exactly four subclasses. So that is also evened out across the board, which yeah. I think is very good. I'm sure we'll see more as we get more products released in uh, the the one D the new revision mm-hmm. as future books come out. But yes, for four right now, very good. Very good. Uh, Druids. The entire main class has effectively been rewritten. Yeah, they've gone through and rewritten a lot of the subclasses uh, because a lot of subclasses were never played because they were bad. Yeah. Druid has been one of those that has been so divisive over whether it's too powerful. Now they've kind of they've kind of distilled it down into what the fantasy of being a druid is, but they're still giving you options to make it powerful just in a single direction instead of this omnipotent direction that druids often became. Yeah, I mean, you could cast massive bomb spells that you can concentrate on and then wild shape, which gives you an entire extra pool of hit points mm-hmm. and you're able to do And it. It just it became a lot very quickly. And specifically, the moon druid would just run rampant and get yeah. a little bit out of control at very, very low levels. Yeah, now uh, they've oh, good. And it would maintain itself over higher levels. Yeah, and now they're 
they're adding in things to make sure that the uh, if you choose the wild shape path, Moon Druid is going to be your best for combat, of course. Mm -hmm. But the others still give you versatility, and like now you're no longer going to be um, excluded necessarily from social encounters because you're mm -hmm. a bird or something mm -hmm. or things like that. Yep, I. I think the druid was way too powerful. I agree. And I think evening that out is going to help things a lot. Another class that I thought was a little bit too powerful and people are very upset by the changes to it are, is the paladin. Mm -hmm. uh, Paladin's divine smite is no longer just an ability that you have where you can spend spell slots as a resource. It's now a spell, mm -hmm. which means it can't be countered. Uh, will your DM counter your divine smite? maybe every once in a while for dramatic effect. Yeah. But that's it. It's still, it's a spell. You're going to get access to it a level sooner because they get spells, yes. they get spell casting at level one as well as the ranger getting spell casting at level one. Uh, and the the ranger's hunter's mark as well has is, is gotten a little bit of a change. I think it's better now. Yeah. Divine Smite is a bit more limited. Um, I think... I think they said it's a concentration spell now, which isn't great. I would have liked it as just a bonus action. You cast it and it just goes on the next hit without concentration. I mean, that's usually the the play pattern because the, the non-divine smite, of, so like Eldritch Smite and all those, are bonus actions that on your next hit yeah. do it. The, the theory is you're going to miss, if you miss this turn, you don't necessarily waste the spell slot. Yeah. Um. Also, the Paladin is getting one free cast of that a day. Exactly. They get a free spell. They're going to get uh, Fine Steed for free. Yeah. And it's going to uh, get... Fine Steed is going to grow more powerful, I believe they said, yes, as well. Yes. Yes. And it, in some ways, I think this is going to change the play... Pa it's going to keep the Paladin powerful mm -hmm. without having being too explosive yes it's gonna get weapon mastery so it's going to just generically have more to do with its attacks mm -hmm. in general which i think is one part that people are overlooking a lot these martial classes are getting a massive buff yeah just from weapon masteries alone and it's just gonna be more fun and have different play styles um it's also going to encourage people to use the smite spells that, yes. you, that people wouldn't normally use. And I think that's good. It's going to encourage people to experiment more with how they're playing their paladin as opposed to being like, ah, I'm just going to smack them real hard every time, which can become boring and become boring for other people at the table too. Yeah, with both the paladin and the ranger, one thing they've done is they've moved, well, a couple of things they've done. They've moved spellcasting to level one. That way mm -hmm. it's an intricate part of the class and you start to learn it sooner. Yeah. Uh, another thing they're doing is they're leaning more into... You get to choose how do I want to build this as either a a more spell slinger focused or a martial combatant focused, um, giving you more options and one the weapon masteries two the fighting styles yeah they're no longer limited in their fighting styles uh, so the paladin and you get the I believe it was Tasha's that had the fighting styles that let you pick a cantrip instead yeah, as well uh, yeah exactly um, so yeah the paladin and the ranger well I have become have kind of come into the middle. Yeah. between the two where the paladin was very powerful the ranger while a beloved class had very low satisfaction mm -hmm. they're now hopefully both coming in to i mean really just become a effective uh, yes. both be effective throughout the game i agree i agree they're they're sanding down the sharp edges of a lot of these classes mm -hmm. uh and in through that powerful things are going to be nerfed and less powerful things are going to be buffed. And people are always excited about buffs, and people are not really excited about nerfs, about any video games, tabletop RPGs, anything. I just saw a, uh, oh, what's that guy's name? I think his name's Shin, mm -hmm. S-H-E-I-N, comics. And he made, he was making a joke where it's like, patch notes, tiny little debuff to a very meta character in a video game. And it's like pointing at the character, you're useless now, you suck, go away. Very small buff that really doesn't change anything to a, uh, a low-tier character. I love you now. You're going to be my everything. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, the Ranger. I love the Ranger. You do love the Ranger. It just got way better. Rangers are... Hunter's are... Mark is going to grow as you level mm -hmm. with it now, which is very exciting. Um, despite all of the classes getting access to Weapon Masteries, the Fighter being the king of the Weapon Masteries is very exciting. Um... Monks having weapon mastery is just going to be give them a lot more to do, and then specifically with rogues, uh, rogues yeah. with the daggers and vex being able to use your bonus action offhand attack without actually using your bonus action is going to be really good for them because they're still going to be able to use their bonus action to hide to 
dash, mm-hmm. disengage, all that kind of stuff. And the can... Soul Knife is also getting uh, mm-hmm. the the weapon property of Vex. Yes, which is very, very good. Uh, one One last bit about the Paladin. Because Divine Smite is now a spell, people are also upset that Eldritch Knights and... Um, Oh my god, the spell the 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 spell casting rogue. The uh, tr- arcane trickster. The arcane trickster and that kind of and the the blade singer wizard or the the swords bard or whatever are now going to be able to get divine smite through picking spells because they're kind of merging a lot of the spell lists or be able to grab it through magic initiate and to that I say okay. That's fine. Jokes on you, people out there. There's no spells. Uh, there's no spell. Uh, Spellblade wizard. This, yeah, in the core. Yeah, not in the core rules, but we'll yeah. be getting. I we fucking better get a blade singer wizard later. Like shit, that that subclass is awesome. I love that subclass. <laughs> I digress. People are overreacting about the paladin, they in my always. estimation, which they always will. Um, the last thing that you have here is the wizard savant features have been redone. They give more access to spells of the associated type. Uh, and other less useful forgotten features throughout all the classes have been just kind of completely reworked and replaced. So the Savant spells would reduce the cost to transfer a spell into your spell book. Yeah. Uh, And that's kind of it. Yeah, now they're giving you just, when you level up, you automatically get extra spells from this, from your uh, chosen spell school of magic, Mm -hmm. um, which is a lot better. It's way better. The wizard is supposed to be the toolbox character, and you have your specialty, and now you're going to have a ton of spells within that specialty realm, and it's not going to count against the other spells you can take that are just staple good spells to have. Yeah. But overall, we've seen a lot. They've talked about a lot of reworks they've done. They've talked a lot about ripping out the bad pieces, putting in good pieces. Mm -hmm. And obviously, 5th edition is something we've played a lot of. We've talked a lot about, especially Mm -hmm. on this podcast. Um and I know at one point we were very, very worried about the the futility, the possible futility of one D and D. Yeah, I think that obviously we still stand by the fact that you do not need to go get one D and D when it drops. You probably don't need to go get it for ten years because that's how much five E content is available to you still. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that a lot of uh, fears, a lot of uh, dis. Uh, cognitive dissonance we've had about this upgrade this improve this change i think has been quelled a lot in my mind personally i agree i agree uh, a lot of people were upset by the drastic changes that they were seeing in uas specifically and we knew at the time though they weren't great at communicating it that they were going beyond what they would do just to see what the community would push back against mm-hmm. and what they would jive with and then rein things into an appropriate level and they have clearly done that uh we're they they revamped crafting. Now there's a new, a somewhat new crafting system that's going to be more useful than the crafting system we got in Xanathar's. Yeah. Uh, weapon masteries is a major overhaul of martial weaponry. Feats are getting a major overhaul. How you're building your characters and the importance of your background and your uh, your species choice combining to be an important background setup for your character. I mean, a lot all the changes I think are going to be good. For the most part, uh, things are going to be less powerful, but that does not make them bad or worse. That just makes them not as powerful as they once were, yeah. which is okay. And I think the parts that they are raising up are going to make the general individual character, or the, the general individual character may not be as powerful as once were, but the entire party as a whole. Mm-hmm. I agree. Is going to be composed better. It's gonna. It's going to mesh better together for sure. Yes. For sure. We might go into the, a deep dive on some of these classes and subclasses at some point, but that's outside the scope of this podcast. I have one more thing. Yes. Jeremy Crawford, I'm looking at you. Oh. Learn to talk faster. Oh, my God. Those videos are half hour long. They could be 15 minutes or less. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I get... I get... There's a lot of great information in them. Yeah. You don't have to speak like this when you're just trying to say that the ranger is new and improved. The improvements we've made to the ranger have really changed it in a lot of ways. Hunter smart. It's like, okay, we get it. Move on. <laughs> I'm already watching you at one and a half speed. 
Anyway, that's all the that's all the news that we have for today. We end the podcast as we end every podcast with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the audience. The best way to submit those is on the Patreon, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros, where we have a question from Brandon who says, what's a collab you would like to see in Magic the Gathering? Which is kind of similar to a question he's asked before about universes that beyond. That was Andy. That was Andy that asked about universes beyond. But Brandon, uh, collabs within Magic the Gathering. I'm going to flip it a little bit. I would love to see a D&D adventure based on magic lore. Because hmm. we've had campaign settings with like the Mythic Odysseys of Theros and Strixhaven School of Mages. Ravnica. Ravnica. I want, like, let's let's see what an Eldrazi D&D campaign would look like. You get the option of these horrifying abominations for creatures and cool stat blocks. You could have Planeswalker NPCs mm-hmm. and you could set it on any of the planes. You could set it on multiple planes and do like a dimension hopping thing. There's a lot of possibilities with that. But collaborations within Magic the Gathering, I mean... I like that idea. I want to... I want I'd like, I like Magic the Gathering collaborating outside of yeah, Magic. Yeah, I would love to see... Maybe this isn't collaboration. Maybe it's just a collaboration between departments. I would love to see a Magic the Gathering video game that's related to Magic the Gathering. Because there's old Magic the Gathering video games that kind of just didn't have anything to do with Magic. They just mm-hmm. used, like, Teferi. Yeah. As, like, just a want a dude who wandered around and did things in the game. But I've been playing uh, Slay the Spire recently. Mm-hmm. And that's a really fun little uh, rogue roguelike deck building game, and I think and I there's Yu Gi Oh War of the Roses. That's one of the games yeah. from my childhood that I loved. Uh, something like that where you actually you get to play as a planeswalker. You get to go around. You get to explore these planes in in three D in three dimensions. All three of them. And and maybe it's uh yeah maybe it's a t- uh, obviously keep magic in it. You know maybe it's a turn based uh, like JRPG. Where your attacks or your whatever, it's like Pokemon where you're summoning whatever, you know, on your turn. Mm-hmm. I think that would be cool. That would be very cool. As terms of in terms of things, what collab would we like to see in magic specifically? Um, I would love to see some D D collabs that are not in the Forgotten Realms. Um I would love like a critical role set. That would be fucking nutty. That'd be cool. That would be very nutty. Um, I was meaning more like Greyhawk or Dragonlance. Oh, that'd yeah, be cool that too. too. I think a ooh a Dragonlance set. You can have my money. <laughs> you can have my ideas, and I'll only ooh. I'll request a nominal fee. I was gonna say it's a great idea. Oh, is it to pay us? Yes, yes, pay us right now. Okay, they didn't. <laughs> All right, uh, going through the... Oh, 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 oh. Yes, the TikTok Live, where we also take questions because we record it live on TikTok. Yeah, so let me scroll back through. Uh, Randy asks, relatively new and have been playing Commander Precons, what's the best approach to building his own deck? Ooh, I think the first step, if you are a Precon Commander player, first and foremost is upgrading that precon mm-hmm. is the first step because that will familiarize your for one it's a deck that you already know how to play and you can familiarize yourself with staple cards that aren't in the precon that are going to go well in in decks of that color combination uh, as well as cards that are specifically good for your commander mm-hmm. that are not included in the precon so souping up your precon would be step 1 and then seeing what other what other card styles, what other play styles kind of speak to you. Like, mm-hmm. did you play against a... Like, were you making a bunch of tokens and you saw a deck that was slinging spells with barely, barely any creatures and you were like, that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Or were you playing a stompy deck with these big dinosaurs and you're like, this is really fun, but I'm really, really struggling against this kind of like enchantment like lockdown auras like like a curse an aura's curse yeah. deck like that seems interesting i might want to try that out or oh my god i got blown out entirely by this graveyard recursion deck i want to see what's up with that seeing what things you're playing like the pods of players that you're playing with and seeing what they're doing and what might interest you outside of your own your own deck 
Yeah, I like the upgrade your precon because in precons, I, oftentimes there's a sub theme or a like secondary theme, and when you have those cards in your hand, you're just like, why? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a very good first step is finding those cards that are why. Why do I want this? This feels bad in my hand. Toss it out or put it in a box uh, that you can later sell at Gen Con. Hey, um, that's what we do. <laughs> Another good way, if you've been playing, I, this is this is a little bit of, uh, down the road. If you've been playing for a while and you like cracking packs, you've probably built up a little bit of a collection. Mm-hmm. Um, and a great way to kind of start is looking at what cards you already have, especially legendary creatures if you're playing commander, and go, okay, this is a really neat looking thing. What can I start to put together from what I have in my collection? And then once you have that put together, maybe play a game or two and then go, okay. What worked? What didn't work? Yeah. If you're, if you, that's a, that's a great way. If you're really getting into deck building, and also don't want to spend a lot of money because you've already spent the money. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The other thing, in terms of your precon, play with your backup commander. Yeah. Play with your backup commander and see what cards are geared specifically towards it that might have seemed bad by the face commander, and then also. Maybe pull out some of the cards that were only good with your face commander and your face commander, and then add in cards that are only good for the backup commander, just yeah. to try and get a different play, different uh, play uh, pattern out of your precon. All right, I'll change this question on its head a little. It's from Colt Dallas forty five, Lathral Blade of the Elves commander deck. They're asking for recommendations. I'm going to say, what's your favorite card that you have in your Lathral Blade of the Elves deck? Lord. Um, My favorite? Honestly, the one one that fucks people up the most is uh, Glissa Sunslayer. Glissa Sunslayer is a very good card. A first strike death touch is a powerful combination. It's a three mana, three, three. You get value off of it from attacking. It's a fantastic blocker. Uh, But more specifically for Lathral... Uh, card draw and token generation systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, she will make her own 1-1 one, one tokens, but you need to make her big to get a mass amount of tokens at once, and you need other cards that generate tokens when you cast elves, uh, other cards that generate mana, either by tapping or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. I feel like Elvish Harbinger is pretty cool. Elvish Harbinger? Uh, Corvectal uh, from... Eladomery Corvectal from Modern Horizons 3 is pretty cool, though I think that card is still a little expensive. Uh, and not really Lathral specific, just kind of generic elf ball value yeah. in a lot of ways. Uh, and then Marwyn the Nurturer, just another value one. Uh, there's a, there's several elves that give plus one, plus one anthems to elves mm-hmm. that suddenly your 1-1 one, one tokens becoming 2-2 two, two tokens or 3-3 three, three tokens is much more powerful as well. Yeah. Uh, and then just card draw engines. Cool. Uh, no more from the TikTok, but I, I thought of one. Um, so a little Dungeon Bro exclusive content oh wow. from my brain to yours okay well that's uh, terrifying with we have three sets coming up yeah three uh bloomborough duskmorn and foundations what are either what are some things you hope to see in these sets either for the good of the game or specifically for play styles you like or hope to see um evolve well i know i'm gonna get a lot of good out of bloomborough because it's clear that prowess is already prominent <laughs> between between uh bria riptide which by the way that one's in the starter decks starter decks are great and are great value pieces for getting just cards from a new set yeah uh it's specific cards and they're not always the most powerful but you get some exclusive ones to that set that other people don't get and just you get cards yeah uh prowess uh, for me specifically. So Bloomborough, I'm excited for that. Duskmorn, I don't really see a ton right now, at least, uh, because the flavor of the set and the things that they're starting to do just kind of don't jive super well with the decks that I'm running. Um, I think the the most interesting one is the the impending creature mm-hmm. uh, and just getting the, the everything lands for, I mean, there's a ton of decks that are three four or five colors that i have and that's just kind of nice value uh it's an enchantment creature so it would go well with my auras deck and in terms of like mostly it's just spell slingery stuff i don't really i don't really see i i think the chainsaw equipment would be fun in my equipment deck but like 
not too much in these sets is like super speaking to me honestly i i like good value pieces um i like i the the gust bloomborough card the exile or you can gift a thing to uh, to blink you blink or exile by gifting and i think that would go well in abdel adrian but like i don't know i don't know i would need to see what legendary creatures i get from these sets because that's where i find the sets to be more valuable to me is when i get a legendary creature i'm like i can slap a bunch of cards onto that and call it good Hmm. you know what about you so for me I'm, i'm speaking more design space is what i would hope to see for in, for mechanic design space, I hope to see two things. One, I would like to see more, uh, more aggressive pillow fort stuff. So right now, a lot of pillow fort stuff is in blue and white, and it's don't attack me. I would love to see more in the lines of Kazul Tyrant of Cliffs, where it's like if you attack me, I'm getting benefit. I would love to see more of those style of cards because right now we have Goad, which says attack everybody else. We have yeah, like I said, Goad's a great mechanic. Goad's a great way. mechanic. Propaganda. We have uh, uh, Norn's Annex. All these things that say pay. You have to pay man attack to me. You have to pay life to attack me. I would love to see you have to give me value to attack me. Yeah, I would love to see that. And the second thing I think I would like to see is we're seeing a lot more lands interaction. We're seeing a lot more cool lands for one, mm-hmm. and two, we're seeing a lot more lands interaction, but. Right now, a lot of that land's interaction is in red, destroy. Um, in, in colorless other lands, destroy. Mm-hmm. In, and green, of course, is always owned to the lands, you know? Yeah. They're the ones yeah. who bring them back from the graveyard. They're the ones who throw extra down per turn. I would love to see black, blue, and... Uh, Black, blue, and white. White has a little mass land destruction, but we kind of stay away from that. Yeah, we're yeah we're not super fond of that in general. But yeah, some way for black, blue, because blue used to have like moon moon moonfolk used Mm -hmm. to be like return your lands to to your hand to do things. Yeah, but like yeah, see these other three colors kind of develop a relationship with land that makes maybe new archetypes or new interesting play styles or just gives you another way to interact with the game as a whole i like i like i feel like white has a lot of it because most utility lands are done in cycles of Mm -hmm. lands and i feel like the white ones tend to be either the worst or like the best yeah in a lot of ways like i feel like in in terms of like lord of the rings with the legendary lands i feel like minas tirith is in some way far and away the better of the ones gives you extra ability to draw cards exact card draw on a land i think leaning into specifically in terms of white, maybe turning cards into basic lands mm-hmm. that only tap for one color or only tap for colorless until you remove the utility of them. Um, I think it would be funny if black was the one that got to exile lands. <laughs> that would be interesting. That'd be neat. Uh, blue, I think they're already starting to do that a little bit with like Harbinger of the Sea, getting a Blood Moon style effect mm-hmm. uh, for islands. I think at a certain point with like... For one, we've we've had two cards very recently that are starting to give you cards of every basic land type between Omo and the Everything Counter, and now the Everywhere Land Token. Yeah, uh, that we're gonna get in Duskmorn. Um, bring back the land walk abilities, forest yeah. walk, swamp walk, f- that kind of stuff that kind of limit who you can attack, and who can attack you, and. I feel like that would just create some more interesting things because the the land walk abilities have just kind of not been around. In yeah, a while. there was that. Um, there was a uh, Ixalan creature, the Axolotl one, the giant Axolotl that would allow you to put flood counters on. And mm-hmm. for like the most part, it was they, well, they're islands and you can untap them. But yeah, like you can throw that at something, and now all your things that have island walk are more effective against your non blue counterparts. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be definitely cool. And I think it, in the the land walk space, you can also get lower mana cost creatures that are more powerful, but they're limited by the fact that they can't attack anybody. Mm-hmm. They can only attack specific targets. Uh, and then kind of cracking that open a little bit later in the game then makes those creatures more powerful sort yeah. of thing. And like that's the limiting factor on them. So I think, I th- yeah, the land walk abilities I think is, would be an interesting design space to explore. That'd be cool. All right. We've been going on long enough. We've probably been, what, we're, we're at an hour 45. Ooh. This oh, is a long Yeah. We had a lot to talk about. I thought we were going to hit two hours. So like I'm, I mean, I'm, we, can we sped through it. <laughs> I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Please, please, please check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros. You can join for free. 
free if you want to ask us questions in the podcast thread. You can also pay $5 a month to get early ad-free access, $1 just to support us. And if you want to get your name read at the end of the show, that's $15 a month or more for the, the top tier level. And that, of course, occupied by our good friend Brandon Volt. Brandon, thank you, sir. You're a gentleman and a scholar and wonderful. Pop a kiss. Mwah. Well, you did you, you, you kiss too. Yay. We've watched Josh Weissman together. That is true. That is true. We have done that. Yeah, we have, we have done that. Uh, you can also follow us on YouTube. Subscribe to us there. TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. You can get the podcast on podcast services around the globe. Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. In the meantime, we love you very much. And peace. Peace.